here we go. We Wait. are here. We are stoic. I think I've done that one before, though. <laughs> Get used to it. Get used to it. Um, hello, everybody. I'm John. I'm Andrea. We are Voices in the Dark. We are continuing our quest of learning how to human. Um, and we have another episode of the Modern Stoic series for you today. This one is based on Seneca letter number 40, which is entitled, Thrillingly, on the proper style for a philosopher's discourse. <laughs> uh, someone without much style, I think, I think they came should, up with this. Yeah, they should be redone in, like, ghetto London accent. Mm. This one should be titled, Speak Proper. Speak Proper, bruv. <laughs> Gotta use words in it. <laughs> so that's what it's about. Uh, it's about how to speak well, speak effectively in public and to others, and how to convince people and convey your ideas. Oh, good. I got what it was about. <laughs> yeah, you did well. Well done. You didn't have to look at my, my notes, my crib notes, as per the last episode. Um, and also, I think there's a bit of a, a nice sideline in this one about how to detect bullshitters uh, from the way that they communicate. So... It's quite reassuring in a way that I'm able to just read this somewhat arcane, old-fashioned text and just get it. So, like, all of those years in academia finally did something for me that I can just <laughs> digest the shit and get what it's really about with the confidence that I get to choose what it's about, really. <laughs> That's my interpretation is what matters. So, um, welcome along, everyone. I'm going to croak my way through another episode. Uh, we're recording... Uh, a bunch together, as is our want. So if you get worried, like after a month of hearing me croaking, I, I haven't been sick for a month. <laughs> no, it was just one intense week. Yeah, so we'll see. Like, hopefully it's not worse uh, tomorrow. Or I'll be like, <sighs> hello. <laughs> now, would this classify as the lurgy? Or is it a very specific type of illness that's the lurgy? I think... Traditionally in Britain, the, the lurgy is just sort of the unspecific kind of bit of a cold okay. kind of thing, but a touch, a touch of the lurgy. Well, I think people can also use that as a sort of, you know, I'm claiming to be sick. But, um, like not what, so you, you could be genuinely a bit ill, like me, or you could be like, I can't come into work today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the lurgy. <laughs> Better than the clap. That just sounds fun, though. The clap's not fun. <laughs> I always forget which one that is. I think that's it's. Uh, I think it's gonorrhea. The okay. clap. Could be wrong. I'll check it for the notes, and send people like a link to like, images. Of what the <laughs> clap looks like. Um, yes. Other. Other. You, you do. You do the housekeeping. Your turn. Sure. Uh, we've been having a lot of fun doing our sex and relationship series. If you haven't checked it out, please go and uh, check out the latest episode with Carsey Blanton on uh, sort of being open, specifically in relationships and love and sex. Uh, and our chemsex episode as well has really uh, generated some interest online. Lots of people sending us sort of messages and feedback about, you know, how it touched them or how they didn't know or how it was a problem. There seems to be quite a lot of interest around sexual behavior yeah. that, you know, we're going to exploit. to <laughs> Yes. Well, the chemsex episode in particular, like... It's a subject, people taking certain drugs in sexual context, it might not sound like it's something that touches your life, maybe it does, but if it doesn't, the, the content of the episode, we really dig deep into a lot of things that really are part of the experience for all of us, issues of insecurity, how we think about what we want in sexual context, the fact that many people are taking um, quite dangerous drugs in the context of sex simply to overcome the insecurities of being able to go, I, I, I want to do this and I want it to be fun. I want to be a bit more wild. I want to be more adventurous because it takes away all the voices in your head telling you you're not good enough, you're not hot enough, you can't. So I think there's a lot to identify with. And I also think it's really cool that we had David Stewart on the show um, who invented the term chemsex in the first place. So yeah. he went to the source. Straight to the source. Yeah. And he, he advised me, I don't know if I said this on the show yet, that from his extensive experience of counseling people who use chems that I really shouldn't take meth because I would <laughs> love it way too much. And now it's like it's created more of a temptation for me. What would you call that as a superpower? Well, meth. No, <laughs> like knowing exactly whether or not a drug would be bad for someone and whether they'd love it. I mean, maybe that's what some doctors <laughs> or like healers really ought to be 
able to do. They're just like, for your kind of personality, I don't think you should take heroin. I don't think, like, if you're going to take something to have some sort of effect, like maybe herbal tea <laughs> instead. What's, what, is there a slang word for taking drugs? Well, it depends. It depends on the type, right? Well, like Damn injecting it. with slamming, right? I just want to pair some sort of word that's drug related to kinesis and make it the, quote, the name of a superpower. What's kinesis? Well, oh, telekinesis oh, uh, okay, or okay, so pyrokinesis. So yeah. it's kinesis in my head. No. But anyway, uh, that's a conversation we can have Another off time. mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so come, come over to our new discussion group over on Facebook, please, yes. people. Uh, look up Voices in the Dark uh, group or just come to facebook.com slash V in the D and you can then click over to the group. And that is where we are posing interesting questions, doing little polls to see what sort of things you'd like us to talk about and also where you can submit questions for the Ask Andrea um, series that we are creating. Should be lots of fun. So I'm you can ask excited. him, like, what's the meaning of life? And he'll tell you, there is no meaning. There isn't a meaning. But, you know, asking quite, you know, practical questions and maybe things the same way that we're doing for Seneca, where there's lots of stuff there you can access yourself, but maybe it's pretty difficult to understand. Um, what we're trying to do is break things down into ways that are more understandable. So if it's maybe more a practical question, not as practical as how, does, how do I reform my, my laptop? Like I, I'm not gonna make a whole big video about that. No, but you know you only do that for your friends. Like answer those questions. Even then, it gets annoying. I hate being IT support. I'm I'm sort of sorry, and yet at the same time, <laughs> you know, at least I try and. So you haven't those. abused it yet. No, not enough. Um, show notes on Voices in the Dark Dot World. If you would like to support the podcast, you feel that it brings some enjoyment and uh, stimulation into your life. You can do the equivalent of buying us a, a coffee, essentially, yeah. or a pint. You can sign up there and just make a contribution of as little as a dollar a month. You can cancel any time. There's some rewards and perks. Um, check it out on patreon.com slash V in the D. I think we have to reset the tiers to be like those you know, African children, Christian fund donation type things, like mm. give us a dollar a day and, you know, they get vaccinated, give us $10. And mm. So we should have equivalent for that, you know, about how drunk we get or how caffeinated. Yeah. Or, you know, whether or not we're or like John can pay the rent. Yeah. This that month. Can, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's the kind of thing. I'm saying. Maybe we do need to make it a bit more real in that <laughs> respect. Cause it's, it's getting increasingly real. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there we go. That's all that stuff, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, and if you don't have uh, money or you don't want to spend the time like uh, discussing in, uh, the show, just telling other people about oh, it. You were oh. too quick there. I was going to say, go fuck yourself. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> and or you could tell other people, recommend the show to them. Um, and if you leave us a shiny five-star rating and review over on iTunes, that certainly makes us smile a lot because we sit here with the mics, with the camera, and... Unless you actually let us know that you're listening, you know, they're just download numbers. It doesn't mean very much. So it's just really no. cool to hear from you and to put some like names to those statistics. It is kind of odd to do essentially performance art without an audience. Yeah, it's peculiar. At least we can always imagine they laugh in the right places. Mm. Anyway, we could add a laugh track. <laughs> we could. We could add a laugh track. <laughs> we just press the button on a keyboard every time. <laughs> So let's talk about this letter. Um, so it, it, he thanks Lucilius, Seneca thanks Lucilius for writing so often. So I guess lots of letters. Um, Which is kind of weird if, it, if, if Lucilius didn't exist. Like yes, he, he's, he's really like trying to <laughs> like really make us believe Lucilius exists. Oh, oh yes, Seneca, your imaginary friend <laughs> Lucilius has written to you again. Oh, he's such a good friend, is he, Seneca? So I hope he was real. I hope so. <laughs> Otherwise, like, Seneca's really losing his mind. Demented, lonely old man. Well, if he feared, you know, isolation and persecution, given that the emperor forces him to kill himself in the end, he had reason to maybe an imaginary friend was the safest and best kind of friend he could have. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. just this teddy bear in the corner with a little stitch name Lucilius. Lucilius like how are you doing today a pile of letters next to him <laughs> each one signed with a little paw print <laughs> so Lucilius the teddy bear writes often <laughs> to Seneca I want one now 
I well, maybe we should make them. <laughs> we should make them and go on Etsy. Um, and Seneca likes this because he says, well, it's basically like having him around, unlike a picture. So I immediately thought like he had a Polaroid of Lucilius. I'm like, it's probably a little wrong historically. So unlike like having a cameo, him, they had little cameos and things and little mm, drawings. They have drawings, that sort of thing. He said, how much more pleasant is a letter which brings us real traces, real evidences of an absent friend? For that which is sweetest when we meet face to face is afforded by the impress of a friend's hand upon his letter, recognition. So that's a bit confusing, but basically he's saying, you know, if we can't actually be together and like have the tactile close reality of it, then the closest we can get is a nice letter where we feel there's recognition and connection actually happening. Um, and that's one of the most powerful experiences for us humans, I think, that sense of being seen, of being connected, of having a sense of presence in other people's lives and vice versa. And maybe we should write more letters. I certainly find that like, people have, have made a point of saying how nice it is when I do like send them just sort of a general email, not because I want something, but it's one of the nicest things when I've received it, if someone's just like, hey, you know, I was just thinking of you, so, you know, a little update, how are you doing? Yeah. To uh, know our friend Zach from The Perfect Gentleman is a big believer in handwritten thank you notes. Mm, they're very nice. And at the same time, I'm reminded, as I watched the, the, new, the newest Chris Rock uh, comedy special on Netflix, it was mm. really good. And he, his marriage is over. Okay. And he, he was talking about marriage and commitment and things like that. And he said, my 16 years are so much longer than my parents' 40. Because when my dad went out in the morning and didn't come back till 8 p.m., hmm. you know, every day, like he didn't get to see his wife. Whereas the minute I'm out the door, I get a text message saying, <laughs> I miss you. <laughs> like, <Yeah>. Do you? <laughs> Do you really? And we have a level of uninterrupted connection with people, which is shallower because it is this kind of digital texty based one. Mm. But at the same time, we don't have, we don't really miss each other. Not truly, not the way that people used to, because we don't have that inability to get in touch any other way other than writing a letter and sending it by donkey over like, you know, the next mm. mountain over. That's true. And I, I saw a thing the other day, uh, where it was like a meme or something that was like, remember when we used to write uh, BRB, be right back? We don't write that anymore because we're never actually away. <laughs> Is it <laughs> always, it's possible. It's not BRB because I've got my phone with me in the toilet. Yeah. yeah you can keep that conversation going as you poop. As you poop. I mean, it's it's... Is that time well spent? I don't know. I think it's it's certainly eaten into my like book reading time, taking the smartphone to the toilet instead of a book. Well, my toilet time has shrunk considerably as an adult. I don't, some, I don't remember when it changed. As a kid, it would take me like, you know, like going to the bathroom was like an hour. Like you'd bring long. a comic or a book, you mm -hmm. sit down, you know, a little bit would come out, then, you know, a mm. few, few, few more pages, and, you know, maybe a bit more. And now I go in and it's all over in 20 seconds. I mean, in some ways, like, I feel envious of that. But uh, other, in others, I, I feel like I'm more of the uh, endurance pooper, like more of the marathon <laughs> sort of thing. You just, you know, so I do have my quality time there mm. and uh, a little bit of private time. I think, well, it does help that I've, I've been using the little squatty potty. I think that mm. makes a huge difference. Yeah, it just comes out. Yeah, it's a, it does because sitting in the kind of armchair position like Westerners do on the mm -hmm. toilet um, is actually non-biologically good because there's, a, there's several things that are wrong with it. But one of them is that the tendon that wraps around the colon right at the rectum is pulled taut. So you essentially have like a little kink that mm. you have to push through, which gets completely released and relieved if you're in the squatting position. I need to get a squatty potty. But not if it ruins my reading time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that wasn't what Seneca was talking about. Uh, no. He was talking about um, nice uh, letters from people. Um, 
And I think I was going to add that it's not only good for staying in touch with friends, um, but it, it certainly is. It's nice to give little updates. But for those uh, of you who are thinking a bit more strategically and maybe you want to do a project with someone in, in the future or you made a little contact with someone at a conference or some shit, just writing a little note in a sort of a chatty style, not too long or whatever, but just sort of being open uh, with, with the content is pretty effective. Give first. Don't just write when you need something. Yes, I, practi I try to practice this on social media, uh, Facebook Messenger, to ask people how they're doing. And because <laughs> my artistic nature would be to completely ignore them until, <laughs> until there's a reason to contact them. But people do like to be in touch with you. And if you, if I've forgotten, I engineer it. Mm -hmm. So let's say, you know, when we launched the podcast, good, two years ago now, um, ish. Yeah, roughly. Roughly. I knew that I had to message people to try and get them to download as quickly as possible to try and, you know, game the algorithm. And I knew that a lot of the people that I wanted, you know, out of my 2000 list or whatever it was, people that I had on there, um, I hadn't contacted for a while. And this would be the, fir the first thing they would hear from me is like, please download my podcast. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, we're launching in a week. I'm going to start asking people how they're doing. How are your kids? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You? Which can seem a little bit mercenary, but frankly, I think we're just commenting on something that most people do anyway. You know, it's not like we're saying do this like kind of dodgy or unsavory thing. I think you kind of do this stuff anyway. You sort of warm someone up a little bit of foreplay. Um, but I'd like to go further and just say, well, you know, to kind of do it by default. You know, if someone pops into your head and it's not that you think there is anything that you ultimately want from them but you think of them, send them a little note. It's really nice, and I, I kind of sidetracked myself earlier, but what I was going to mention is that a few people that I correspond with, like friends at a distance, um, have said how much they appreciate the kind of emails I write, where it's sort of the chatty things I've been up to, a few like thoughts on this and that, and, oh, maybe you'd be interested in checking out this thing, whatever. Because it's not just another email that's trying to sell something or again, like somebody wanting something or some sort of spam, it's actually a more human connection. Um, another tip that uh, on the basis of the, the handwritten letter thing, it's now super rare to receive a handwritten letter. So if you actually want to get through a busy person's like uh, sorting field. It can really stand out. Yeah. All the little kisses delivered with a Lucilius teddy bear as a gift. <laughs> Anyways, the it's kid. such a nice surprise because these days the only thing we get by mail is bills <laughs> or stuff we bought, you know, eviction notices, like the, <laughs> the, the, the TV license people trying to find you. Like it's, it's hardly ever good news. Yeah. So to get a nice card, think how nice it is if you get birthday cards around your birthday. Like, oh, look, it's handwritten things, human connection, blah, blah, blah. Um, so Lucilius apparently has been writing that he's just heard a lecture from the, a philosopher called Serapio. Um, although the, the footnote in the wiki source is like, we don't know who the fuck this is, so maybe it's a teddy bear friend. I don't know. <laughs> Another He's talking Another. to his imaginary friend about his imaginary, imaginary enemy? Mm, maybe. Well, it's uh, not his enemy. He just doesn't like this dude. Seneca doesn't. So, so Lucilia says he's, he's heard this lecture and that uh, Serapio spoke incredibly fast in like torrents of speech. Uh, Lucilia says, for the words come in such quantity that a single voice is inadequate to utter them. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Seneca doesn't like this. <laughs> he says, I do not approve of this in a philosopher. His speech, like his life, should be composed, and nothing that rushes headlong and is hurried is well ordered. That is why, in Homer, the rapid style, which sweeps down without a break like a snow squall, is assigned to the younger speaker. From the old man, eloquence flows gently, sweeter than honey. So... Okay. It can certainly be the case that it betrays uh, a lack of confidence to sort of gabble and just kind of desperately try and fill the space and the time um, and the silence, rather. But I don't know if it's such a clean-cut thing. I'm not saying that gabbling away is good, but I don't think that wisdom or a sense of wisdom necessarily comes with speaking slowly. Well, Seneca goes on to try and play with the balance that we'll get to I in don't a sec. Know if it's the speed per se, but it's the 
being measured and concise mm. and thoughtful about what you say results in the speed being slow. Whereas being like Trump and just kind of following your own internal psychosis, your mm. mind breaks down and waffling about anything and everything. Seriously, go and read the transcript about when he talked uh, about nuclear. About nuclear. About nuclear. <laughs> And it's like a good two or three paragraphs worth of like what, like you go back to the beginning because you forget what he started talking about at the mm. beginning because it's something completely different at the end. So it's and not it, just about the speed. It's that are you just filling the space with sound? Yeah. And, and people that are just kind of trying to bamboozle you by throwing noise out of their mouth mm. tend to have the style which comes across as being fast and erratic and forceful. But it, it's more about it's accusation sorry it's a downstream effect rather than accusation hmm. i think it's something i've wondered a bit about um or reflected about for myself in that i remember i gave some lectures to some a-level students at some point and uh, a bit of feedback that i got from the organizer not actually anyone in the audience mind you was yeah, I think you tried to do too much and maybe spoke too fast. And so I, I sort of thought about that. I thought, okay, well, I definitely was speaking faster than some of the other speakers. And yet at the same time, I didn't feel I was rushing. I felt so I, I and, and the kids themselves seemed to really like what I had to say as to whether it sunk in is a, you know, I didn't look for their exam results afterwards. I'm like, oh, they all got A's, it's because of me. But I think maybe, and what I hope is the case, is that the energy with which things come across is kind of important. It's not just you're speaking at too many words per minute, but are you, is like the rhythm there is, say you, you could say like in, in rap, someone who's rapping really fast, oh, I can't keep up. Well, I think actually if they've got like good rhythm, a good cadence to it, you do. Okay. Maybe. I mean, people want to want to correct me and say that I talk too fast. I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But uh, I, I think I have to make a conscious effort to speak more slowly. But at, at the same time, I think it all depends on what I'm what I'm trying to do is communicate the thoughts as they emerge. And generally when like now we've been practicing and doing the podcast for a long time, I think probably we've got better at being able to concisely or hopefully clearly communicate our thoughts. I think, although I'm not 100% sure, that we don't use many filler words when we talk on our podcast. I was uh, talking to someone that edits a friend's podcast yesterday and he was explaining that he really wanted to sort of cut together a version of the episode with only the stuff that he cut out, the old, um, <laughs> hey, um, uh, so, like, <laughs> cutting them all out. And I was just trying to think about whether or not we have filler words or um, repeat back stuff too much, but I think we just sort of mostly get to the point without going, um, and, uh... I hope, but, I mean, it's, it's very hard to talk about this kind of thing because now we're, like, monitoring ourselves yeah. as we talk ah. about it but anyway the like answers on the back of a postcard oh, i was that asking was you because you tend to listen back for quality control so quality control <laughs> well I, I actually listen back often at double speed which so is probably done it's a bit mind fucky but and i can't do it this is this i mean that's actually quite a good example of the sort of thing that seneca is saying isn't good um i don't think that it's a good idea to try and listen to an audio book that you want to really engage with at double speed. I don't think you're going to be able to have the capacity for it to sink in, mm. in a way which is going to last. You, you'll be able to sort of follow the general thread of it, but it's not really going to sink in and resonate with you. Like, okay, you could listen to a piece of music at double or triple speed, but are you really going to get what the music was about? Um, I'm able to do it with uh, our podcast because I had that conversation. So it's not right. out of nowhere new information. It's because it's, it's us. And I already, you know, at least have some sort of latent memory, I hope, of what we spoke about. Mm. Um, so... Oh, there goes an arm. 
<laughs> you get it. I'm gonna fuck you up. <laughs> Still, Seneca also says that being ponderous, overly slow, is just as bad, and he takes some time to mock that a little bit. But overall, he seems to prefer slower rather than faster. I I would agree. Mm. It's the difference. It shows thoughtfulness. It allows the mind of the person listening to sort of fill in some gaps, to have anticipation about what's going to come mm. next. It, it keeps engagement. At the same time, I think it all depends on who is your audience and what are you trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. So if your audience is the average American voter and you what you're trying to achieve is to bamboozle them into thinking immigrants are bad, Trump's speech is perfect. <laughs> it is fantastic. Whereas I think Seneca would be appalled and you know, think of him as a populist that, you know, is swaying the masses to do bad things and, you know, think that he wasn't a good orator, but except he kind of is because he does, you know, people think he's wonderful, the people that like him. Hmm. I think that it, it's both about the purpose, as you say. Um, <laughs> every time I um now, I'm going to fucking freak out. <laughs> <laughs> I can, like, keep my thoughts together because I'm going to be like self Just remember, um means vagina in Arabic. Well, that, I'm just going <laughs> to keep saying it more. <laughs> I thought you want to keep vagina out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's coming from my mouth and not ah. into my mouth. Uh, depends whose it is. I think that there was some point that I've maybe halfway uh, lost. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At this, uh, this point after that vaginal <laughs> revelation. Uh, it, I think that it, it was to do with the fact it's not just the, the, like the impact or the purpose of what, what you're, you're trying to have and get across it's that there's a bit of drama in talking and you can leave the pause in the appropriate place if it's clear to the listeners that something is coming it's not just that you're riffing and there's nothing there which I think people can sense but I think we have this fear sometimes if we're not a confident speaker that if you pause, someone is going to jump in and take over control. And that can happen if you've got insecure or attention-seeking wankers as your audience or your, the circle that you're talking in. But generally, people who do have that kind of slower vibe, I think if you, the next time you're in a conversation with someone who speaks a bit more slowly and thoughtfully, when they leave a long pause, you're waiting to hear what they're going to say next. People... Yeah. Go, okay, something else is coming. It, it helps especially if you can see them, so not it's not so clear on the phone, whatever, but the attention isn't immediately lost in a sort of jump cut, oh, God, we need to fill every available second here. No, and if you're talking to someone who is trying to make themselves feel significant by having something to say and wanting to chime in, it doesn't matter about not giving a pause so he can't he or she can't interrupt because mm. they're not thinking about what you have to say also the whilst they're waiting for their gap it's actually mm. better to allow them to speak and uh, lately <laughs> my, something i've been trying to apply because i've been re-listening to the harry potter audiobooks mm. and i'm just trying to think as a as my own personal stoicism uh, crib sheet mm -hmm. what would dumbledore do because he's quite stoic. He's quite well measured, very thoughtful. He'll wait for, like, he'll smile and let someone sort of, you know, say what they have to say, and then go. Well, I think you'll find, <laughs> like, at the end. Mm. And it, it's quite, it's quite a, uh, it's an interesting character, but also very, very good example, literally re literary example, of someone that chooses his moments, chooses his thoughts, and isn't afraid that if they don't do something immediately or right or, or you know full of emotion quite a stoic character to me i think the timing as well as like saying ne less than necessary and letting other people feel that they've had chance to express their side of things which can be phenomenally important in all sorts of conversations from business meetings to relationships people want to feel heard and then there's space and an emotional space for you to say what you think and what you want um, but also just being able to pick your timing, which is something I'm trying to work on at the moment, uh, 
relationship wise in the I have this kind of compulsion with a lot of if I feel anxiety over something or feel I need to fix something or do something or share something the impulse for me and I think probably for quite a, a lot of guys I don't know if this is really a, a gender split thing but I don't know it's uh, it might be um I want to do it now <laughs> right now because it's as though the the tension gnawing at the center of me like i need to get this thing done won't be assuaged unless i do it now but i'm being confronted repeatedly not in like a dramatic or bad way with just moments of recognition where i go okay so i need to tell you this now and i'm like that didn't make any sense to say this now you know you've got other stuff on your mind you're busy or you're not feeling so good at this moment you know it's it's not the best situation to go oh so you're re you're really kind of stressed out with with work and so on right now so now is the time to bring up the fact that there's a, an overdue credit card bill or something like the, not in the moment where somebody's already stressed no timing um what was what, looking back at my notes here yeah seneca says whilst ponderous is not uh is not a good thing. He says, nevertheless, the word which has been long awaited sinks in more easily than the word which flits past us on the wing. Which is true. That's like the build up crescendo rather than just like zoop. If the point was only to get to the end of it, then I think this is something the philosopher Alan Watts said that when he was talking about why meditate, he said it's not to get to the end. The same way the point of music isn't get to the end. Otherwise, all music would just be like one crescendo note and that's it, done. It's actually to enjoy the experience and go on a yeah. journey with it. Um, but there's, you know, there's a basic and obvious point here that if you just rush through things, you're not going to, people are not going to grasp the point that you're trying to make. And this is all pretty valuable stuff in, the terms of, in terms of the art of public speaking and trying to convince and inform others of your view. Seneca goes on to say that things have to sink in. He says, besides, speech that deals with the truth should be unadorned and plain. This popular style has nothing to do with the truth. So the popular style is more like fancy talk and style over substance, which we'll get into. Popular style has nothing to do with the truth. Its aim is to impress the common herd, to ravish heedless ears by its speed. It does not offer itself for discussion, but snatches itself away from discussion. But how can that speech govern others which cannot itself be governed? May I not also remark that all speech which is employed for the purpose of healing our minds ought to sink into us. Remedies do not avail unless they remain in the system. I like that as an image, that the stuff has to sink in, whether it's a healing remedy, as he thinks philosophy is, or simply the point of view that you hope that other people would be able to see and maybe even adopt themselves. It doesn't make any difference if you just don't, uh, don't find a way in which it can actually be absorbed into the system for them. Do you used to get told stories as a kid by your parents, like bedtime stories? Uh, yeah. Were they any good? Mm. Not the stories, them as storytellers. Hmm. I don't think that they kept doing it into late enough age that I can remember the particular okay. stories. Do you remember enjoying the stories? Yeah. I, th I think you kind of see, I mean, it's very rare for a parent to do a completely shit job. <laughs> They know they have to do voices. They know there has to be little pauses. And it's funny that we forget basic storytelling concepts when we're having a conversation. Mm. But we would never dream of monotoning really fast a bedtime story. No. Whereas if you go to an academic conference, you would be amazed at the people <laughs> who think that that's precisely <laughs> what you need to do. <laughs> Retards. I've been locked in so many awful rooms with that happening where someone's got 15 minutes to deliver a paper and they decided that, of course, they can do a 50-page paper in that time delivered in a monotone. And then are more and more amazed as the person who's meant to do the timekeeping is like, finish now. And they're like, but I'm not finished. I've got <laughs> 50 more pages to go. <laughs> um, so I, that, that sinking in image I really like. And... I, th uh, I thought of something that uh, I've been hearing Seth Godin go on about a bit recently. 
I think he goes on about it quite a lot, which is how people really fuck things up with PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentations. Yeah, um, very he, common mistake. He uses tons of slides, but they do not have words on. So what he does is help people focus and allow the words that he is saying to sink in by giving them perhaps a visual metaphor to focus on. But I think also, I don't know if he's explained it this way, but this is my interpretation. If you're listening to something, it can be pretty useful to have an image there so that your eyes are receiving something that isn't too distracting or complicated. And you begin to associate the image with the words, which is almost like its own mnemonic device. Yeah. It needs to, yeah, you, it, it, that, that's exactly it. Uh, the amount of presentations I had to sit through in corporate environments where the people were reading out exactly what was on the slides, each and every bullet point, mm. or crammed the bullet points. I'm like, just give me the, the, give me the presentation. Why are we sitting through it? Mm. It's awful, truly awful. There is a minimum, a maximum amount of slides. Like, do not do more than one slide per minute of presentation. That is, that is just insane. Like, I've seen people try to do that. It becomes like a, it becomes like a torture device. <laughs> like it, it is. <laughs> I feel like you're trying to be indoctrinated by the... The way I use uh, slides when I've given papers and presentations is more as a sort of... Either if there's a term or a point or an image that I want people to be able to see to help them sort of grasp what I'm trying to communicate, that's useful. Or if it's basically just very short few word bullet point things which help remind me where i'm steering yeah. that's it if anyone's ever unsure of how to put together a good powerpoint presentation take a look at any of the peak steve jobs apple uh product launches or keynotes when's that peak jobs peak jobs is uh, i guess from iPhone, oh, probably even older, but I would say from iPhone launch onwards, mm -hmm. that that particular era, I think they got really good at you know beautiful animations only when needed, simple, very clear, concise. Um, there was a method to the madness. There was a particular journey that people were being taken on, and it's it's. I mean, maybe it's not perfect. I'm sure people will be able to nitpick, but it's definitely a good starting point. Like mm. if you, if you're shit and people are complaining <laughs> about your presentations, uh, go check that out. And if people aren't saying actively that was a great presentation, it probably wasn't such a good presentation. Mm. <laughs> Silence is often more evocative. Mm. Yes, you'd have to go really badly to get a coworker to tell you you're shit. Yeah, I think people T like to avoid conflict. Text on the screen is not good for an, another point here, because the speech that's being spoken is essentially being overloaded or diluted by the fact people are trying to read what's on the slide at the same time. Um, and I find, uh, and I think it's true of quite a lot of people, that if you have some sort of visual thing, it helps anchor the stuff that is being spoken about in your mind. So I find it easier to go back to like remembering a particular layout of a page that I was trying to learn something from, or if you can connect to like the picture of a mountain or whatever that you're, you're doing, the thing you're talking about, visual learning, very good. So it feels weird that Seneca is giving his tips on PowerPoint, but <laughs> it's essentially what he's doing. Um, he goes on, Seneca does, to question whether you'd even want to learn from someone who gabbles along without actually communicating. He says, Just as you are well satisfied in the majority of cases to have seen through tricks which you did not think could possibly be done, I guess like a sort of magician thing, it's very gratifying to see through them, so in the case of these word gymnasts, to have heard them once is amply sufficient for what can a man desire to learn or to imitate in them? I like word gymnasts. I disagree because the reason you have to arm yourself against these types of people um, is because they're very effective at uh, stringing you along. Mm -hmm. When there's no new information, no new... Um, bit like no possibility for something that you're looking to do to advance in any kind of way they can keep you thinking that something is being done or or you know movement is happening mm -hmm. when really it's just obfuscation and that is a very useful skill to learn for yourself because there might be times where it might be useful to do that to people 
screen. It's not particularly nice. No, but. I wouldn't advise using it as a default, but understanding it as a tactic, like even just certain turns of phrase um, that could let people believe what they want to believe, I guess, for a moment. Maybe you just need a little time to make the thing happen that you promised would happen, actually happen. Um, but I, I was thinking, well, Seneca says, you know, hear, hear them once. So hopefully you grasp what they're doing in but that time. Do you think you could acquire the skill of doing it well? Maybe not doing it well. Once? But I, I don't know if just listening to them is... The right way to pick that up? Mm. Maybe. I'm not sure. I think sometimes it comes... Uh, I think a lot of people who have this obfuscation skill, I don't know how much they have really consciously tried to do it. I think it's quite often seems to be this sort of natural seeming way in which they communicate because maybe they learned it as a child growing up or they found they kept doing it and it was effective and are very confused. It, it, it's not as though I think if someone is just a constant chatterbox obfuscate and not communicating anything to be able to go, shut the fuck up, dude. I know what you're doing. Would you just get to the point? I've, I, I don't know if I can remember particular cases, but I feel like I've sort of tried to do that with some people who I found very obnoxious and they're just very confused. It's not like they go, there's not even like a flicker of, oh no, you found me out, you found the trick. They're more like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, this is the, what, what I do. This is who I am. They're like the actual big windbag. But I'm sure there are others who have intentionally adopted this style. I feel like... If I ha was going to adopt it, I would probably have to study someone that wasn't doing necessarily consciously mm. because I didn't learn that. But I'd have to analyze it and break it down. Mm. Just like pick up artists, try to look at su people successful with women right. and break it down into steps. Yeah, well, that makes sense as a learning technique if you really wanted to... To learn how to waffle. <laughs> learn how to waffle. Maybe that needs to be the, the, an e-learning course that we create. <laughs> That's what we want to be associated with, Jesus. I hope people are glad that we only do like roughly one hour episodes now. <laughs> not, not 90 minutes and Maybe that's hours. the name of the course. It's how to be 12 ways to be awful in order to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> awful like success teaching tips. 12 different like, techniques that terrible people do that actually work out. Well, speaking of awful, who jumped to mind for me in this context is, of course, internet sensation Ty Lopez. For those who don't know who Ty Lopez is, you're living in a beautiful world. <laughs> <laughs> he is a dude who seemed to become famous for YouTube videos in a sort of bullshit course, a certain number of ridiculous number of steps. The six, 67 steps. And then there were like bonus ones to like being successful or something. He's a guy who does very well in his video waffling, has a great deal of followers, appeared on, has appeared on lots of podcasts, like came back on like London Real and was on like three, a three hour show. And people think that he's smart and intelligent. Partly it's because he uses basic tricks like hiring big luxury houses and pretending that they're his or implying that they're his in his videos and like, Oh, here's me in my garage, famously, with my Lamborghini, and it's not his car. By this point, given all the money that he's got out of people for his bullshit, he, maybe he does own the fancy cars. I don't know. But the reason I bring him up is that if you were actually to, as a little homework exercise, if you dare, watch like one or two of his videos and try to write down more than maybe one or two bullet points of things that he is actually saying and communicating, I think you will struggle. Yeah. He can fill the time. He can do things like, oh, I'm quoting Nietzsche now. Oh, I'm mentioning this significant figure. I'm mentioning these sorts of emotions that engage you and your sense of frustration. But whether it be through like the, the academic training that I've done or just who I am as a person, I don't know. I immediately would confronted with his video get like 10 minutes in and be like but he's not saying anything no there for is three nothing. hours for three hours he's saying nothing he just manages to lightly dance around and segue about without ever actually telling saying you anything at all of any value for anyone yeah Bigaboo. which is amazing 
It's like almost a performance art. Like it thing. is quite spectacular to be able to. It's not an enjoyable performance, but at the same time, you're just like, well done, sir. I don't know if I could talk that long and not <laughs> try and say at least something. <laughs> I mean, it'd be nice to have like at least a point, a little message to take away. But no, there's nothing. No. So don't give him your money, you know, unless it really makes you feel good, in which case maybe see a doctor. Um, but there is, as you were saying, there is some usefulness for this sort of thing, which is that... Um, oh, it, it, the longer he talks, the more conversions he gets. So selling his packages, mm -hmm. he's learned that if he goes on for three hours, he gets more sales than if he only like spent one on it. It's like the used car salesman who just won't stop talking. In the end, you just sort of capitulate. As long as he keeps pressing like the emotional buttons and so on, it's like uh, a guy whose name I won't mention that you had certain connections with. He would just talk at you until he got his way. Because you just have to, you kind of give up and tap out because it's just this overwhelm of someone who simply bulldozes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very common amongst narcissists, people with narcissistic mm. personality disorder, or just even just being slightly more on the narcissist sort of lean of the personality type. Um, but it, it, it's, yeah, I don't know how much of it is conscious sometimes. I, I think for Ty Lopez it is planned. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the most terrible thing about online marketing and online courses and those types of th that that type of industry is that it's self-selective for people that don't really want to put in the work mm. um, but they're just looking to be saved from their life so it, it, they're so bored or upset with where they are with their job or life mm. or relationship they're looking to feel good about themselves they're not looking to change they're looking to feel good ah. about themselves and so it's the sales technique is about con like getting them over the hesitation they want it they want they or they're on that webinar because mm -hmm. they want to buy from you and you just have to talk to them long enough that they suddenly go okay i'll do it and then they feel so good that they took a step towards success. Mm. And that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for the lesson. So you don't have to give them value or content. So in a way, everyone's quote unquote happy. Yeah, they, they got what they wanted by buying something. Mm. Because they've, they're, they've equated that to taking a step forward. And because those are the people that pay most frequently or the most, what inevitably happens is that every person that offers these types of packages starts to more and more do things that please that crowd. Rather than the ones who want real change. Yes. And so it inevitably leads to a point where even if what was, was started with was good, it, it, it ends up being just, I don't, I don't even know what to call it, that there's got to be a way to sort of summarize it. I, w I started reading a book um, called The Self-Help Addict, and he, uh, the author essentially was that kind of person. He'd just like be dying for the next thing and like, oh, I, I buy this book, that's great. And oh, look, there's an online seminar thing. I should definitely buy that. And every step was uh, powered by the sense of like, oh, relief, because now I can, you know, tell myself I'm learning more things because I'm in taking this, but then never take any action afterwards. So it's sort of a self-help addiction. On the other hand, his book, uh, I actually, you know, you can return books on Kindle if it's within two weeks and you're uh -huh. just like, I don't like it. So I returned it because I thought, actually, I think your book is basically another one of these books that isn't about clear action. Plus, he seemed to, without any sense of like remorse, shame or, uh, I don't know, self-reflection of any kind, kind of big up the fact that a great thing that he did to change his, his business when he realized that he was a terrible manager and he, he hired someone to actually do the, the managing of, of the staff. And then out of nowhere for him, because clearly he's not very emotionally intelligent, she leaves and is just like, fuck this, I'm never doing this. So he outsources everything that his company does to like a competitor. And he just gets to like basically have all of his clients serviced by what was formerly his competitor. And he just tells this as like a brilliant breakthrough. And just as kind of a footnote is like, so I fired all of my staff the same day. And then I was able to run my business from just hanging out in a, in a hotel lobby Wi-Fi hotspot. And he's like, this is the kind of great change that you can make when you take real action. I'm like, you just fired everybody, you cunt. Yeah. And became a middleman. That's yeah. it. 
You're not adding any value whatsoever to the process. No. No. So I return the book because even if there is good quality in it, the fact that he wasn't even able to be self-reflective enough to like note that he just put a lot of people out of a job and that's not a very nice thing to do on a moment's notice. It's like, dude, you don't get my money and I don't want to hear what you have to say. Dick. <laughs> anyway, um, there was, so you've touched on it already, but I also made a little note about there is some value from the, the, what we can learn about the Ty Lopez people. Uh, whether or not you want to do it, it's good to be aware of it, that this is how lead generation and marketing stuff works that it gives you, it's like, it's like the smell of frying onions. You're like, hmm, hmm. You're not actually getting to eat the sausage, but you're smelling the onions and you're like, oh, I'm kind of having something like the experience of eating the sausage, but there is no sausage. Even if you pay for it, you're not getting the sausage. You're just getting the onion smell. There is no nutrition in this shit. Um, and that's the danger when people with all their like emails that give you like, oh, look, here's a little bit of value first and a little bit of value here. It's actually bullshit stuff that's either screamingly obvious or is something that's completely freely available with always the hint that the real cool stuff is what's in email number four that you have to pay a thousand dollars for. And the ubiquity of the Internet and direct marketing and uh, targeted advertising means that these assholes are ruining storytelling. <laughs> They're making us, is it inured? Is that the right word? Mm -hmm. To common human, basic human like tropes that make us, that has made, have made us feel good for the last 20,000 years. There will eventually be a point where anyone that tries to use a hero story against us will smash them in the fucking face <laughs> and makes them eat their teeth. Whereas, you know, we used to enjoy watching Lord of the Rings and, you know, Luke Skywalker do their shit. But if someone comes up with that in a movie, it's like, is this a marketing plan? Am I going to be upsold in the next act two? You're definitely being upsold for all of the Star Wars merchandise. <laughs> um, so Seneca even cautions that if you, if you get carried away by the words, you might lose control. He, sa he, he says it's a bit like running downhill. You can't really get yourself to stop at the point that you intended because you're sort of tumbling along with the force of your words. Um, so he then sort of gets a little bit playful, although this is Seneca playful, so it's not that funny. Um, he, he says that you could speak like a, a famous stutterer, which is to speak gradually, letting things out just bit by bit, sort of composed. He says maybe he's exaggerating for that example, but he also gives the example of uh, Cicero speaking quite slowly, carefully, oratory style. And then he says, we're better than those Greeks who just gabble away, blah, 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 silly Greeks, the Romans are better, fun, fun. Um, instead, what he likes, he says, the Roman language is more inclined to take stock of itself, to weigh and to offer something worth weighing. Um, Fabianius, Fabianius, don't know, a man noteworthy because of his life, his knowledge, and less important than either of these, his eloquence also used to discuss a subject with dispatch rather than with haste. Hence, you might call it ease rather than speed. I approve this Ooh, quality. I like word. Ease. Is it an ease? As if you're holding on to the words and slowly letting them out. Like, like meat from a sausage. <laughs> <laughs> it says, I approve this quality in the wise man, but I do not demand it. Only let his speech proceed unhampered, though I prefer that it should be deliberately uttered rather than spouted. Neat. It's kind of, you know, have something to say and say it. Let it out in a nice way. I mean, like, if you want to drink what's in the bottle, it's better that you sort of, you know, tilt the glass a bit and pour it down and don't just, like, turn it upside down and, <laughs> and then it just goes everywhere. How many marks out of 10 do you think Seneca would give Hitler? Hmm. I don't know. I never learned German well enough to, like, truly enjoy the oratory of the Fuhrer <laughs> in the way that it would have been <laughs> yeah, at the Churchill. time. Um, well, Churchill was pretty good. He for, was very good. For the the way in which he spoke he he understood the poetry of words and if you if you read some of his uh history writing uh it's incredibly beautiful very enjoyable to read it's kind of the style i guess 
pioneered significantly by uh, Edward Gibbon for the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which was about this sort of beautiful kind of performance of what it is. It's like, I'm going to tell you this thing, but I'm going to make it a very beautiful story. I'm going to write with such style and grace that you'll forgive me the fact that I'm going to make it a billion volumes long because it's, <laughs> yeah, you can just luxuriate yeah. in the prose. Okay. That, and the rise and fall of the Roman Empire is a good example of this? Decline and fall. Decline and fall. Um, yeah, um, not something that I ever read more than a, a few bits and bobs of, but I recall, I, I could be wrong, but it's filed in my head away as like a a significant moment in how history was written mm. in like bringing it to life as though i mean the kind of the kind of figure that people think of as like represented by Stephen Fry these days as a, a kind of a, someone who's very in command of language who is going to tell you this story and take you along for the ride okay. but it's still it's still pretty old fashioned um whereas i mean churchill of course is a bit old fashioned too but it's it's kind of like the a version of this is the rather than picking up the academic tome for a particular subject if you go and get like the penguin published paperback um like say if it's russian history go and pick up a book by simon seabag montefiore former journalist but also historian by training um and he writes with verve and panache and brings it all to life. He uses a lot of artistic license, so like proper historians don't like him very much. He's interested in like the sex and scandal. But if you like open one of his books and you, you put on like the movie trailer voice and you're like, and then the blood flowed through the cobblestones, <laughs> red, the color of revolution. Okay. You just, you're drawn in and you're excited. And then you care more about what's being talked about. Cool. So, what else we got here in my notes as we come towards the end here? Um, it certainly seems like, despite Seneca's grumpiness, his overall position is is pretty good. Try not to go crazy and don't just spout any old shit. Have something to say rather than just say something. Um, and I hate that at public events and sort of Q and A after someone's given a talk where people just want they put up their hand and they don't have a question. They just want to talk. And they, they should go and have a podcast because then you can just talk. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have anything really to truly contribute. I think they're often quite lonely people. I don't think they've got anyone else to talk to. And they will happily, viciously sometimes, want to just keep and keep it. And take advantage of the fact that it's a lot of people feel uncomfortable to be able to tell them to stop. Yeah. Where it can be such a beautiful moment if someone like puts up their hand and says simply, so you were talking about this theme in the letter of Seneca and it made me wonder about this point. Um, could it be a bit like this? What do you think? Oh, that would be you know, nice. Like, oh, <laughs> fantastic. We've got a little bit of that more and more lately. Mm -hmm. It's been quite nice to see that. Yeah, not just crazies. Mm. I heard once again the little factoid that uh, people are more scared of public speaking than they are of death or whatever. Like mm. that's the number one fear for people. And I, I remember just I was, someone else was having that conversation. So I was actually just sort of a eavesdropping. It, well, ex it, within earshot, mm. but not part of the talking. And I just remember thinking for like it just kind of clicked for me. It's like thank fucking god <laughs> that most people are deathly <laughs> afraid of public speaking. That is like a, it's like the best thing that's ever happened to <laughs> humankind. Because most people don't have shit to say. I guess that's a reasonable point. When you get into one-on-one -on -one conversation with them and you're just kind of politely nodding and thinking, God, please stop. Please stop. I mean, Terry Pratchett quite uh, famously or maybe famously to me said, or they say that everybody in the world has a book inside them. And for most people, it should stay there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... I think, you know, to, to be a little more sensitive on the other side, kind of Philip McKernan style, there are people who have a beautiful and amazing thing to share, a story and insight and experience. That's why he does the one last talk thing. And he really helps them overcome the fear to share something worthwhile and meaningful. So we're not just saying, don't simply assume, maybe that's the point, don't assume either that what you have to say is extremely important and relevant or that it's not. Yeah. Well, I don't assume that, an average person doesn't have anything of value to give me, but mm -hmm. 
but I do assume that the likelihood that they'll give that to me instead of all the other bullshit that's <laughs> on top of it is very small. It'd be so nice to just be able to have a little sort of ability to see. I mean, maybe this would get a bit black mirror, but like if you get into the, the, the taxi or you go and meet someone at a cocktail party and a stranger and uh, it like looks at your, you know, super, super Facebook style series of interests or whatever and just gives you in the heads up display in your eye. You have m mutual interest in these areas <gasps> and you can cut the crap and go. So you really like uh, Ryan Adams solo work. Let's talk about I that. Like that. Wouldn't that be cool? I'm going to take it a step further. Like the algorithm finds out and figures out what the one thing worthy that you have that's worth of saying out loud is. So mm -hmm. people can get, jump straight through it. Be like, tell me more about the switch from lead piping to plastic piping. And then as soon as that's over, like, like it vanishes and you know that they've got nothing else valuable to say. It's so like, bye. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a sort of version of this that exists within Tinder that it will show you if you have mutual interests on Facebook. Yeah, but, but it's not good because mm -hmm. there's all these things you liked like 10 years ago. But also it's mutual interest. Like the fact that you both like something doesn't mean that they have something valuable to say about yeah, it. Yeah, it's different. Like the fact that you both like travel <laughs> doesn't really <laughs> lead to any specific kind of useful yeah. connection or insight. Um, and yet it would be really nice to... I guess there's there's ways without the the crazy black mirror technology to be able to do it that I find some handy sort of tactics if you can get towards like a more interesting conversation. So maybe there's you detect that they've mentioned if you're like, oh, yeah, so what have you been up to recently? And they say, well, I'm worky this, blah, blah, blah. But I've also been doing some yoga. And you're like, OK, that sounds like the thing you're actually interested in. And I'm thinking of a particular conversation I had meet, meeting someone. I was like, oh, yoga, is that something that you're really into? And ask them how they feel about it, how they think about it. And then listen out for the points of tension where this person and in many other conversations I've had, there's a similar sort of tension where they're like, yeah, I feel so good when I, I, I do this thing. I, I get into it. But, you know, it's just a, it's just a hobby. It's nothing. I'm like, well, why do you think it's just a hobby? Why, why are you so dismissive? of it and before hardly any time has passed you can get to this i find it quite beautiful this sort of deep connection where they're something that's really been bugging them and they're emotionally caught up in they're sharing and you as potentially the perfect mix of like someone who seems nice but is also a stranger can really help them and after you've done that you can have a, a really nice deep conversation about all manner of things mm just kind of feel out and try and detect a tension point and don't and then ask questions about it don't tell them maybe you should do this maybe you should do that okay and be like a bit like an annoying kid but not in an annoying way don't keep saying why <laughs> my little nephew was doing this like actually doing it like that like your little dick it was hilarious to watch because he wasn't asking me <laughs> but say well, wh why not why, why wouldn't you want to, why, why don't you want to try like doing some of the yoga teacher training? Like what, what, what's stopping you? Would you like to do it? Yeah. Do you think maybe you could give it a go? It's really kind of helping people over the threshold. <laughs> now I have to sell yoga courses. <laughs> what are you giggling about? <laughs> you thinking Just, a dirty thing? No, no, no. Just thinking through the that and other, I don't know I've lost myself okay well uh, <laughs> I'll round up whatever the, the last bit that I've got here about the notes um, Seneca kind of repeats himself a bit and overall round things off by saying be slow with words but uh, an interesting point before he just kind of signs off with that like be slow down he says words even if they came to you readily and flowed without any exertion on your part you would, yet they would still have to be kept under control. Don't, you may be able to have a facility to just continually talk, but you need to be using them for something. Um, and I was kind of reflecting on this a little bit recently by coincidence, that whether it be from podcasting or when I've like run conferences or 
even just having conversations with people who maybe don't know each other much yet or I'm meeting someone for the first time that I seem to have, at least when I'm halfway awake, this odd ability where I can just tell my mouth to start talking and then I'll work out what I'm going to say a few seconds in without it being pure, meaningless waffle. Not just I'm going to spout and there's nothing to say, but I trust that some words will come out and I'll be able to hopefully uh, help avoid the awkwardness of the awkward silence, facilitate a connection between two things or two people or whatever, and that it's not going to just sound completely vacuous. And yeah. I feel a bit more confident about this since like listening back to our episodes when I write the episode notes, where I've remembered, oh, in that episode, I definitely was just, I felt like, oh, I was waffling and there were... And I listen back and go, oh, it sounds totally normal, actually. It seems <laughs> the things seem to link together. It's not like it was just complete nonsense. And so I thought maybe I didn't bring that up just to talk about me and what, what I can do. But I thought maybe it's worth, if people feel a bit insecure about that sort of thing, is maybe thinking up some useful phrases that can be your go-tos whilst you get your thoughts in order. Not in order to hog the spotlight, but to facilitate flow and put other people at their ease and create a positive atmosphere and maybe I don't know what some phrases would be mind you I guess it depends on context but I mean it could be horrible filler phrases like well the thing about that <laughs> or in my opinion I would say and that, that does buy you enough a few seconds mm -hmm. but then you better come up with something it's yeah, a bit say well uh, yeah that's interesting hmm yeah that makes me think You've already got a few seconds there and you don't know what it is. I also think it's quite cool to sort of interrupt yourself. That if you start going, saying something, maybe it's filler going off and then you actually get the thought. You go just in the middle of the word, you go, no, actually, actually, this is the energy of the, oh, I've come up with something or let's talk about this. And then you're showing you're engaged and excited by what you're about to share. People forget the thing that you were half-assed beginning yeah. to say. Yeah, and in most cases, unless you're being recorded, it doesn't matter. Mm. We are, so it does we are. shit. Shit. We have to be a little bit more onto it. But I think we're both pretty good at kind of hitting the ground running kind of thing. And I, I totally do the same thing. Not only do... Like, I almost need to do that. It's not like, mm -hmm. it's oh, it's a good technique. It's, I don't even know what I think about something until I start speaking about it. And then, like, it just comes. There seems to be a stronger connection to the subconscious once you get the ball rolling. Whereas if I have to kind of think, it about, think about it in my head before and decide mm -hmm. what to say, I kind of go blank. I think it seems, at least from what I can observe from the outside, that for you it's in speaking a lot of time so that you do work out what it is that you think or, or, or want to say. I know you do a lot of thinky box time for maybe bigger conceptual things, but it seems to me that you can clarify and get out more clearly through speech stuff that, say, for other people, they write to find out what they think. That it's in the written form on the page that it helps, and maybe other people paint to find out what they think. It's especially true with queries. Huh? Like, Qu if... A request for some kind of information ah. comes externally to me. Mm -hmm. I have to start speaking to get it out. Mm. If I'm generating my own thoughts, like it, they can go on without me having to vocalize, or you know, mm. like I, yeah. I know what I'm thinking about. When someone says, "What do you think about this?" I, I, it comes easier if I start speaking about it than if I just sort of sit there thinking. Maybe that's it. another useful technique. Is not in a sort of facetious way, but uh, to be able to just turn something around and say, yeah, what do you think about that? It's a great rhetorical sort of uh, master of being the host and the facilitator and seeming more intelligent than perhaps you otherwise are, mm -hmm. is that you keep asking the questions subtly people don't notice because they find, they find it flattering that you're very interested in what they think but you don't have to put anything forward yourself. And I'm not saying, yeah, use that as a big tool of manipulation, but it can certainly be something that well, you make someone feel good. If you're not sure what you think about something, then find out what they think and then maybe respond. 
be like, no, that's bullshit. <laughs> Why did you say that? Cool. We done. I think I. I think we're done. I think I've run out. Yeah. We I don't want to overdo it. No. I don't know we're what's going to happen with my voice. Necessary. Yep. Don't <laughs> gavel. No more ums. No more um. I don't want an um ometer. For anyone ever. <laughs> <laughs> next, next time, more stoicism, we're going to be talking about a letter called On the God Within Us, which sounds surprisingly Buddhist. Really? You think so? Okay, that's interesting. Cool. Mm. So we'll find out then. Mm. We'll catch you next time, everybody. Until then, please be silly, be kind, and be weird. <laughs>